the 2017 hurricane season will forever be etched in the minds of persons living across the Caribbean. More than 200 people lost their lives across 12 islands in the region, and another 1 million people were affected. The hurricane season included Harvey, Jose, Irma, and Maria, the last two of which were consecutive Category 5 hurricanes that ravaged the Lesser and Greater Antilles. It was by far the costliest hurricane season on record. The World Bank estimates economic losses at 1.3 billion US dollars in Dominica alone. These are the stories of some of the persons from the most impacted communities. And that night, after dinner, where we, we were informed of the hurricane, but we really didn't think that it would be so serious. So after dinner, we, we went to our usual place to sleep. The wind started blowing, started blowing very slowly, and then it started more rapidly. And then I told my husband, you know what? We'll have to get out of here. The Prime Minister is the one I remember very saying it. Don't just take this hurricane very seriously. I mean, one of all the time he was on the radio. But I, I don't think many of us take it very seriously. I personally, um, honestly, did not take it very seriously to an extent, but very seriously. It's only on the morning um, of the 18th that uh, I started um, reinforcing. I'd buy other things, but reinforcing windows, um, blocking holes as necessary. The hurricane, the shop had current. People had their, their TV. So we used to always go and listen to those things by the shop or by the police station. Up to say for me, I don't even know where that have hurricane shelter here. If when I know hurricane coming closer and it's it worse, I, I, have to, I have to try to see if I get some shelter. When overseas, I have my son in Canada and um, he was keep on calling us, calling us, calling us and telling us, Mommy, what are you all doing? Where are you all are? I told him we are upstairs. What all you are doing upstairs? Mommy, get down, get down to the basement, take everything and go down. Because you know what, mommy, that hurricane is going to strike you all straight, straight, straight. You take a bed, take a pillow, and take a mattress and go down and stay in the basement of the house. It was Monday morning after all the decisions were taken to close the country because of a Category 2 hurricane approaching. Um, we had the Emergency Operations Center activated. So I was at the emergency operation center um, up to about six o'clock and decided that I would have gone home and um, assist from home um, by providing information to the general public from my home and would alternate it, you see my home, you see my home. Um, but about seven o'clock, we started lo losing connectivity between myself and the EOC. And uh, from there, everything just went downhill. I just had the experience of Tropical Storm Erica. And uh, driving from here to my home, I mean, it was just amazing to see the numbers of people who were just outside and um, under the, the, the verandas and, and that we're begging them to go home. So, but I know whenever you have not that I want to see them happen often, but whenever you have a lull, a long period of no activity, then people fall into a state of complacency. We went in, in a very little cozy corner. The, all we had with us was an extra shirt to put on and a flask of coffee. And then we stayed there. And eventually, the wind started getting stronger and stronger. So we had two chairs in the corner. We sat, and all we could do is pray. Felt water coming down our way, seeping our way. I told him, you know what? The roof is gone. By the time it was about 8, 9, 10, um, that I got a message from my friend in um, St. Kitts that he messaged me and told me, look out, that is coming over, very terrible. Uh, and we were up doing, um, preparing while those downstairs were having fun because they're young people. They had never seen maybe a ter terrible hurricane, so having fun. And then when it starts blowing, we start, the water was coming inside. Um, 
everybody praying, my, my wife, sister, saying, oh, they're slicking down there. I said, this, it will always wait inside. Don't worry about waiting. We'll get wet. What you want to do is that just, it doesn't get worse than that. But waiting, we have to get, just prepare yourself. We are going to get wet. We stayed there. When that wind start to blow, I tell you, as if somebody was just hitting the house with bricks, I hearing all sorts of noise. A certain time, the window went off. But my son now never slept. He stayed on trying to take plyboard and everything and trying to nail and trying to nail. I tell you, I had a grocery shop there as if somebody was just taking bottles and just heating on the house, heating on the house. I hearing galvanage and everything just blagadow, blagadow, as if it's... I hear people screaming. I think, I think my husband, something happened to some people. He said, oh, you know, where are you, where are, you are there? You, <laughs> you don't know. But I say, listen, what is happening outside there? Noise, noise. <clears throat> I, I tell you, we never, never sleep. My husband, myself, and the two little children, my son and his girlfriend, we stayed on one little bed like that in the corner. A certain time, the house, like this, ba this base here, the water started dripping. I was getting scared because I thought, no, that would collapse because um, water started dripping down. Me, me and my brother living there, and we haven't got no, shelter, no good shelter. We don't have no good home. You see, we went up there in up St. Simon in the house up there. They tell us, they tell us, when you are not there for wood and those things. So I don't know, I don't know what to do, what to say. It's in the basement of my house, the lower level of my house. And uh, then we started uh, hearing these furious winds out there. And by about 9, 10 o'clock, that's when I think we really felt the impact. After a while, I just started hearing all kinds of strange noises um, upstairs. Now, I thought for a while that um, my entire upper level had collapsed because of the significant noises I was hearing. We was running from room to room, and then when I went to one room, I saw that there was no galvanage. I didn't hear it. I just saw empty. So I didn't alarm anybody. I just go back <laughs> and I told my wife and this, I think we can stop doing the preparation. Now it's time to look for safe, somewhere safe to hide. Now is survival time. <laughs> After a while, I started feeling the walls of the lower level um, shaking and I could feel some sort of trembling effect on the, on the floor, which means the even the foundation was moving. And at that time, I, I got real scared because I thought the house was going to collapse on me. It's because now we are trapped inside. It's too late to go outside because outside there were two other structures outside where they smashed. We can hear the bottles, we can hear the galvanage and everything crashing on the outside. And we held three of us under this table and I tell him, put your feet inside, put your head inside because there will be object. There will be object coming our way. So just don't look at any of the roof gone, we never see any roof. We cannot, I cannot witness where we saw, we can see, well, I, I saw a galvanage or a rafter went. We cannot see that at all. We just know when we look up, we saw when the lightning flash, you could see yourself. There was nothing to say, well, like you say, panic. This one is growing in excitement. There was nothing else. I think everybody was saying a prayer, say, God, this is it right now. So you do your will. I tell you, I prayed that night. I prayed. I, that is one thing I never prayed before, eh? And I was calling on him all the time, all the time I was calling on him. It was a real panic. There was, there was one of our main mistakes that we did, not, we did not come together as a group. So some of them said some of them. So the dong says was panicking for us, and we were panicking for them dong. <laughs> I, I knock and then I say, are you guys all right down there? <laughs> then my boy came out and he embraced me. Daddy, are you? <laughs> that was the emotion part of it, because he thought I'd die. Then I told him they were right. And I say, I'm going back to see my other guests upstairs. We're all getting wet. See, the damage was done. This pit, part of the, the kitchen we had gone. Water was coming inside. And now there was rain, 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 rain. And we were in a waterlogged below. We heard um, some voices calling us. It was, there were two friends who, were, who had come to look out for us. And then when they saw the damage up, they passed this way and they came to look for us. They called and we answered. And they asked, are you all safe? Are you all alive? We said yes. And they left. At about 3 or 3.30, thereabouts, in the early morning, I started seeing lights on the outside, which means people were out 
And, but at one time, I thought I was the only person alive, eh? because I, did not, I, wa I wasn't hearing any screams, I wasn't hearing anybody talking or anything like that. So I thought I was the only person alive, based on what I, I, I had been hearing. But when these people came out of the lights, I realized people were sort of surveying what had happened. So there were a few people alive. And then two guys were passing with a conversation, and one said, but nothing happened to this house, referring to my house. And the other one replied, well, it's the disaster, it's the disaster man that stay in there, so he know how to build his house. As we couldn't sleep. We started getting wet. And then we waited until the dawn of day, when I could make my way out. I carry a, a satellite phone, so it was raining very heavily the next, that, that early morning. So I went out in my garage and dialed um, one of my um, colleagues who was in Antigua. And because of the rain, I had to step out of the garage, see something, go back to the garage. And you know, with satellite technology, you have to be in an exposed area. So I would lose the call and I would dial again. But I was able to get enough out to the person so that he had a sense of what had happened and he was able um, to call the U.S. Embassy in Barbados and give them a report, um, and that is from our U.S. aid um, standpoint. Um, we started getting, seeing lights from the outside and realized that my Navy house has completely blown off, my mother's house gets ruined, my brother's house close by gets smashed down. For me, it was so shocking that you would just stay and watch, don't have much to say. I, I, it doesn't much for me to say, I'm looking around, and just thanking the great spirit that nobody was injured. It is done and we are, we are alive. One or two o'clock, we had somebody calling us. <clears throat> but it was very dark outside, so somebody started calling us. We are, what happened to us? Where we are? We say we are in the basement there, but we cannot open the door. We cannot come out because all the galvanage and everything fall behind the door. Everything went, everything flat, flat, flat in Dominica. Everybody house uncovered, everybody house gone. So when I tried to went, I went outside myself when I, when I see that, I start screaming. Okay, I look out, I told him, then I told him, Uchi, everything is gone. Everything is gone. And I came back, I brought him out, we walk out over broken um, window panes and so. And then I moved, I left him in the bus shelter with no roof on on the other side and I'm, I told him I'm going to his brother's home to see if we can get rescued here. So off I, I went out and sort of explored the community and the community was just devastated. I think maybe um, out of maybe the 250, 300 homes or houses in that area, I think there were only maybe about six that were um, sort of um, not really untouched but livable. But even though we had the best, not the best, even though we had, we, we had prepared for a limit of time, uh, that would still would have gone because um, there's only so much you could do. I mean, who, what else could you put on the, on, on the galvanage? Then it's nailed down, the wind take it off. But it went with the whole rafter and you can say, okay, we need shutters. Shutters, um, no hurricane, I'm hurricane. Everything, we lose our television, we lose our set, we lose everything. We didn't know how to restart. It was really a terrible time for me, but our passport got wet. My certificate of title, it too, got wet. We had our medication with us, and because we had very little time to run with anything when we thought it was really serious. So then I just thank God for life. Because I, what I say, the only thing is that we have to start all over again. It's like we, we just came to a place where we have nothing. Then everything got wet, every blessed thing got wet. Spent days and days and days washing by hand in a ravine on the other side. That was the only little source of water at the time. So the next morning, I walked down from my home to, to downtown um, to help to establish an EOC and to meet with NEPO and what have the National Emergency Planning Organization. A walk which would normally take me 45 minutes took me almost four hours because we had to be climbing over landslides, we had to go down in the valley, we had to cross 
several passages of, of rivers because all the bridges between my home and downtown were sort of compromised and so on. Major access problem, a major communications problem, and within a few hours later, we had a, a major security problem. So pretty much that's the story about Maria. And the Prime Minister was um, available. He had walked from his, he, he, his roof, part of his roof also went where he lives. Um, however, he walked from his area to downtown, which is another lengthy walk, but he was able to go to the cabinet room, go to his office. His office was also compromised, um, but the cabinet room was intact, and a few other ministers assembled there. And uh, for the early days, I think we only had about half a dozen of the ministers and one or two of the permanent secretaries. Most of them were caught in their area because nobody could move um, to, to anywhere. However, we were able to start the ball rolling um, with whatever we had and start doing some kind of assessment of, of what had happened. I think the early warning systems worked well to a point, like everything else. Uh, we were able to get information, we were able to disseminate information, um, but uh, from the time, 7, 8 o'clock that night, once we lost connectivity, I, I, that was just it. Uh, I saw people on the other side, they had cricket and everything, they, everybody worried. Nobody cared much about hurricane, because to me they didn't say it wouldn't, it wouldn't be all that strong. Well, we learned many lessons. <laughs> we learned many lessons that... If when we, uh, we have to listen to the weather report always, and then uh, we have to be prepared for anything that is coming. Because I said, if another hurricane is coming, it's not going to meet me in that week. I'm going to, take, I'm going to pick up everything I have and bring it in my basement. As long as it is there. Yeah. If everything gone, but I know I have something to get afterwards. And after, um, when the hurricane start, when that Maria started, light went off. DBS went off. There was no communication for those who had uh, probably phones and things like that, but we never had any. We didn't know what was going on. But um, I think they should try to put something where people can get the news or something. It is a ham radio where people can tell you, look, that is happening, where people get scared because everybody get to the shelter. Where we have to go, where we have to go, we don't even know where to go. That was one of our biggest challenges. People cannot hear anything about what is going on. People do not know what we are doing or what the government is doing. People do not know what, the, what is happening in the village right next to them. Some of us didn't take it seriously. It was of value. But many of us, including myself, because I, I thought, you know, we, after David, the, or, or there were other hurricanes which never caused such destruction. So for me, I didn't really take it serious, really seriously, because I said, well, maybe, you know, it would just be strong winds and maybe we would pass somewhere else, maybe go to some other island and we would not be affected, but not knowing that it was, was for us. The main problem we had with uh, Maria is uh, the fact that it gained in strength um, from a category two to a category five in quick time, which has never happened in that quick time. Um, so it's, it's pretty much a record. Uh, it's also the biggest storm that has ever hit um, a Caribbean country um, for all our lives put together. It is left to if the mechanism is being done at community level, where you have local groups to sensitize people. And then our link here was communication. To have, and I, and I, make, uh, I make that observation already for people, that where you have you have mobile phone, it's not working. We don't have a ham radio situation, we don't have it. But if we have a megaphone or, or, or mega mic, um, something you can use in community. Because uh, simple, simple news that where is water distribution, those who are injured can go to A, B, but if that is put in place before this season and then you have a chain of command where those things can happen, then people are, are more comfortable. Shelters, some people, did go to shelters, some did not. So those who did not go, they started putting up their little bits and pieces together so they could have a shelter over their head. And maybe there should be more um, shelters in place. More shelters and that people can 
really go to those shelters. So those who feel insecure could go to the shelters early, early enough. The standpoint we would maybe want to see is the private sector take ownership of their own security, do not depend on the state fully. Yes, the state has its responsibility to secure them, but not fully. What we have to do um, going forward is to ensure that they are a little more robust. Um, but it's easier said than done. <laughs> How do you make um, something robust? Um, put, putting it out there, exposed, because it has to be exposed. It has to be exposed so you get the, the, the rain um, information. It has to be exposed so you get the water levels from the rivers and the streams and the ravines, wherever they they're installed. So it's, it's sort of difficult to, to make it robust or even more robust. But again, we have to look at it and do whatever um, we can do to ensure survivability um, because it, it plays a critical role in um, really alerting people. This year, uh, we, wouldn't have, we wouldn't even have to see hurry Kane. From the time we say hurry, they will certainly hurry and do something. Hoping for the better. <laughs> there is hope. <laughs> Given the significant loss of life and the monumental damages of the 2017 hurricane season, the Cruise Steering Committee requested a review of the Caribbean Early Warning Systems post-disaster. This led to an expert review of lessons learned in the Caribbean, launched in January 2018.